Welcome to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of 2 Corinthians. We're going to continue our study in 2 Corinthians. Turn to chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> stand with me if you're able and follow along at the reading of God's Word, beginning in verse 19. Reading 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 19. <clears throat> Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, uh, swellings, and tumults. And lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many who have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Father, we commit our time of study here to you, Lord, that as you would speak to us through your word and uh, enrich our minds with the truth therein, that Father will be receptive and Uh, eager to receive that which you have for us today. May the words in Scripture come alive in our hearts and our minds today and invigorate our hearts. And we pray, Father, that we will take the initiative uh, to deploy that which you give us, to put it to use in our lives, to apply it in a fashion that it will be pleasing to you. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. I titled this message, The Heart of a True Apostle or Teacher. Uh, Remember, we've been studying for some time now about the false apostles, the false teachers who have literally plagued the Corinthian church and caused so much trouble, uh, undermining, at least attempting to undermine, that work that Paul and his co-laborers had accomplished there uh, in teaching the truth the truth of God's Word. And they have um, done the devil's work, if you will. Uh, Those who do not believe in Christ are children of the devil. We know that because Jesus said that in John 8.44 when the Pharisees said that they were of their father Abraham, thought they had everything right, and uh, they rejected Christ as the Messiah. And Jesus told them that their father was the devil. And what we do understand is that is true of every unbeliever. You either serve one of two masters, there's only two, it's either God or it's the devil. And the only way to serve God is to be his child through faith in Christ. Um, And the false apostles were just that. They had transformed themselves into ministers of righteousness. They weren't transformed by the power of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, through faith in Christ. Um, It was just a job for them. And they did their job well according to their standards. But their standards were self-righteousness. And what we've been studying is the damage that these um, self-righteous, self-appointed ministers uh, had accomplished in trying to undermine the work of the true apostle and the true teachers there. And uh, Paul has spent much time, as we studied, particularly back to chapter 11 and verse 1, about Paul having to boast uh, reluctantly, very reluctantly so, about the work that he was doing and his calling because the false apostles claimed to be true apostles. So he had to make that distinction between himself and and the false apostles. Uh, remember that, and, and we, we never hear say, well, you know, how could that happen? Well, all I got to do is look back at our life before we got saved, <laughs> and we were in the same boat. But it's, it's 
it's important to realize that our, that our relationship with God uh, is through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Christ. Christ is the Word. It's faith in God's Word. It's always been faith in the Word of God. That's what's required in order for us to be saved by God's grace. Now, as we go to uh, this particular section of Scripture, and, uh, you know, last week we talked about um, Paul's unselfishness, if we will, as we've been talking about his credentials versus human greatness through this period of time. And today we want to take a look at Paul particularly because he's the, he's the main character here uh, by way of people. But, of course, he's a servant of God, serving the Lord in all that he does and all that he says. Uh, except he's not perfect, just like we're not perfect. But his desire for the people of Corinth was different than what they thought. Uh, some people think that, that, that pastors uh, just perform their job, but there's, there's people. The, the responsibility of a true pastor, of a true shepherd, of a true apostle is to care for the people. Uh, yes, they have their appointment from God. God anoints them with His power, with His Word. He calls them and enables them supernaturally. But the reason that we do what we do, and all the reason what all godly teachers do what they do, is for the people. It's for the people. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's an injury law firm. There's the largest one in the, in the United States, as far as I know, uh, maybe in the world, and they advertise a lot on TV, but their theme is for the people. Um, and when we give our life to the Lord in service to Him without reservation, we will love others because the Scripture says that if we don't love our brothers and sisters in the Lord, we're not a child of God. And so there's nothing more important for us to handle than the Word of God. And that's what Paul is all excited about here because he wants to make sure the Corinthians um, receive the Word of God and are not swayed and tempted uh, by these influential false teachers to go away from it. And there was evidence that that was in fact the case. And so he wanted to nail down the fact that he was a true apostle handling the true word of God and the false apostles were mixing in air and causing a commotion there uh, and perhaps they didn't even know it. That's the way the devil operates. The devil, um, we sort of get jaded. That means you sort of get a slow walk towards evil uh, that... It's sort of like going into a, a restaurant that does it right. I've been in restaurants where you be, you're there about the 4 or 5 o'clock hour when they decide that atmosphere is what you need, and so they turn the lights down. You'll be sitting there, and the lights go down in the restaurant. Um, well, some restaurants don't actually do it that way. They fade it very slowly, so you don't even know that it's darker by the time it's done. And that's the way the devil works. The devil gets in and mixes a little bit of air with the truth um, using people, because people are either serving God or serving the devil. Those ministers that are serving the devil, self-appointed, self-righteous, what they're doing is they're feeding. They're not doing it on their own power. It's the power of the devil working through them. And we understand in the book of Ephesians that we are fighting a spiritual battle. It's a battle. It goes on continuously until God decides to shackle uh, the devil for a thousand years, tie him up before he puts him into that fiery pit. But the devils, when he, when he went, you know, God called the devil and said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm going to and fro in the earth. Well, that's what he's doing. He's going to and he's got all these demons if you will, the fallen angels, and we have all these evil, evil spirits, and they're all around us, and they're working hard to try to tear down the work of God. And there's a spiritual battle going on. The Corinthians were a target of the spiritual battle. We are a target of the spiritual battle. Uh, we're, we seem to think that we're okay here, and we seem to think we're okay if we go elsewhere, but we're never okay if we come out from under the power of God's Word and allegiance to it by way of obedience, if you will. So this, um, the heart of the true apostle, I call this first verse, verse 19, uh, the heart's desire. 
That's the heart's desire of a true apostle or a true teacher of the Word of God. The desire ultimately is to please God, is to please God through the teaching of the Word, so that God is satisfied with what we've done by way of study and preparation and delivery of, of God's truth. <clears throat> so what Paul goes into here is the fact that his desire is simply that the church might be built up. He says in verse 19, again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? That's what they were thinking. They were thinking that, um, and of course he uses the word we because he not only includes himself, but those who are co-laboring with him and, and those that work with him. And he said, we... Um, you think that we are trying to excuse ourselves. Well, the word excuse there is a legal term in the Greek, which means to defend, like in a, in a court, if you will. So to defend. Uh, so uh, Paul is not trying to defend himself. He's not trying to, to make it, to make, you know, that word is our root word for apology. He's not trying to apologize for what he's doing here. He's not trying to defend himself. He's defending the word of God. He's defending God himself is what he's doing. But it's just like David. When David went out and found out that the armies of the Philistines have, defy, have defied, if you will, uh, God, you know, he said, we got to do something about that. And so he went to the defense of God's army and he sacrificed, he was willing to sacrifice himself, and God saw him through it, and he was victorious over Goliath the giant. And the, the, the agreement was that if anybody could have, uh, get Goliath, they could have the they win the war. Right? So David took it upon himself, uh, no doubt encouragement from God, but God, because David gave himself to the Lord, a man after God's own heart, he, he didn't even think about whether he was capable of doing it or not. We ever think about that? David didn't think about whether he was capable. And the first thing we do when we have a we sense a leading from the Lord or an obligation or responsibility or some duty or service to perform, we then look and say, okay, well, what do I have to do that with? How can I do that? Am I able to do that? We just need to understand when God calls us to do something, just go do it. Because God will provide. If God calls us to do it, he will give us everything we need to do it. <clears throat> and you know what? We might not do it like somebody else, but that's not what God's looking for. If he wanted it done like somebody else, he'd have called somebody else to do it. When he calls us to do it, he wants us to do it, and he'll enable us to do it. Well, the thing here is that <clears throat> the word of God uh, was under attack because Paul was a minister of God handling God's word and he was under attack. And what he was saying is, I'm not trying to defend myself to you. I'm not trying to defend myself. He said, here's the reason I'm here in verse 19. <clears throat> You're thinking that we are trying to defend ourselves to you as if we've done something wrong. Well, see, false apostles probably had to apologize and defend themselves or to cover things up and commend themselves um, as a cover up for, you know, maybe something that went awry. But Paul says, no, he says in the second sentence of verse 19, we speak before God in Christ. Powerful, powerful statement. We speak before God in Christ. What we're saying is what God tells us to say. God has given us these things to teach. It's his word. So we're not speaking our, what we think. We speak before God in Christ. Why in Christ? Because Christ is in us and we're in Christ. Because we're a new creation of Christ. We're no longer our own. So we now, and Paul being a leader, a spiritual leader as being an apostle and a pastor and a teacher, He's not defending himself. What he says in the next phrase is, but we do all things, all things, everything we're doing, dearly beloved, is for your edification, for your edifying. Uh, edification is a construction term. It means to build up, to build up. It's upbuilding, to upbuild the people. 
Upbuilding does not mean make people feel good. You say, I'm going to go build somebody up. No, no, no. Don't make them feel good. Give them the truth. Give them the truth. The truth should make us feel good. If we have faith in Christ, and if we don't have faith in Christ, we need the truth to teach us that we need faith in Christ. But he says, I'm doing what I'm doing. Everything we do is to build the church up. It's for you. It's not for us. So Paul simply makes a statement there. He says, we speak before God in Christ. Paul was, was not trying to defend himself. Uh, he had said previously in, in, uh, the, in 2 Corinthians, God is my judge. And so God being his judge, God is the one who examines him. And he did not feel... It's important because he said in the beginning of verse 19, you think that we're excusing ourselves, we're defending ourselves. But Paul was not trying to defend himself uh, about because of what the Corinthians thought. He just keeps presenting the truth. That's what he's doing. So his boasting was only presenting the facts, the actual truth, God's truth about the distinction between himself and the false apostles for which he did not need to defend himself. What he was doing, even by way of the boasting, although other things are included in this phrase, what he was doing by way of the boasting is not trying to defend himself and make himself look good before the Corinthians. It was just trying to give them the facts. And then you have to make up your own mind about the truth, whether you're going to accept it or not. And then here comes the key. So what's the difference in accepting it and not accepting it? Did they have a New Testament then? No. Everybody didn't have a leather-bound Bible in their hand in the Corinthian church. Uh, You know, they had the the first letter. We're looking at the second letter here that he's he's writing. And at the time of this writing, they already had the first letter. And it's about a year later he's writing this letter. So then you think, okay, there are false apostles over here, and they're teaching error, mixed in with truth. And then there's the true apostles, the true teachers who are teaching the truth. How do you know? Say, you know, you look and say, well, how do I know that he's right? How do I know Paul's right? How do I know some of these false apostles aren't right? Faith. Because Paul was speaking God's word. If you look at Romans chapter 10 briefly, and I know we, we've seen this principle before, but let's revisit it. <clears throat> let's go down to verse 16. Romans 10 and verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. That sort of fits the Corinthian church, doesn't it? He was talking about the Israelites here when, when Paul wrote the book of Romans. They have not all They have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? The report is is what's given by way of the truth. And Paul said that what they were speaking was the truth uh, of God in Christ. So that's what he was speaking. And not everybody's believed according to verse 16. So in verse 17, Paul wrote, So then, the conclusion of the matter is, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how do you know if somebody's telling you the truth? We today can be like the Berean believers and we can search the scriptures and see whether or not those things are true. We can do that. But when Paul was preaching the gospel, he was a God called preacher. God called him, sent him to the Gentiles of whom the Corinthians were a number of and to present the gospel, the good news to them, the truth of God's word. <clears throat> How could they concretely know that what he was speaking to them was the truth? Faith. Faith. Because it says there in, in that verse that faith comes by hearing, hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And what Paul was giving them was the word of God. It takes faith. Faith. You have to put trust and confidence in something you can't see, touch, smell, feel. You know, you hear it. You, you can't 
you can't, all you can do is understand it. And God gives us the ability to understand it if we seek the truth. <clears throat> when the truth's presented to us, we should certainly seek it and pursue it with all that we have. <clears throat> so Paul said, we speak before God in Christ. We go back to our text <clears throat> and we see here, it says, what we're doing is for your edifying. We're trying to build you up spiritually, <clears throat> not intellectually, spiritually. And there's a huge difference. Uh, Paul had told the Corinthians in the first letter that, you know, you can't understand this stuff naturally. It takes a supernatural understanding that comes by the power of God. Comes by the power of God. Now, <clears throat> so his, that's his heart's desire. So then we take a look at the next two verses and we see what, what the expected results are. The expected results. What did Paul expect? He was trying to edify them, not excuse himself or defend himself. What was he expecting? So in verse 20, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. Lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, <clears throat> swellings, which are conceit or pride, and then uh, tumults are really disorders in the church. And in verse 21, Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many who have sinned already and have not, there's what he's looking for, repented. <clears throat> Paul wrote the first letter. He wrote the first letter uh, after he had been there. He had a visitation there, uh, if you will, um, uh, on his second missionary journey, and after that, he wrote the letter to the Corinthians after hearing of their state of affairs. They were wallowing all around and wavering in their faith. <clears throat> so Paul wrote uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians to them, and that was following a second visit to Corinth. Uh, and uh, following that second visit, he wrote a letter. Uh, we don't have the letter. It's not in the Scriptures. Uh, and so it's not a part of the canon of Scripture. Um, but we know that he went there and he, he wrote a letter a second time. <clears throat> and then he went back to Ephesus. And when he did, uh, he wrote 2 Corinthians. And he had been there twice. He was looking at going there a third time. Well, the first, the first visit was good. A lot of people got saved. Uh, but between that and a year later when he wrote this one, there had been a lot of disobedience within the church. Evil seemed to be running rampant through the church. So Paul wrote a severe letter, that, that, but, you know, and that's what this is. But he wrote a letter before this admonishing them. And now he's writing this letter to admonish them for what they were doing that, were, that represented disobedience to God. And so he wrote this letter and... <clears throat> And, he, and he, he's, we've, we've gone through all of this letter, if you will. And at this point, he's saying in verse 21 in the middle about those, he bewail many, the word many is in there, who have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, lasciviousness, which they have committed. <clears throat> so he's writing again. His concern was for the people that the church would be built up. They'd be strong in the Lord, unwavering in their faith, and they weren't there yet. Paul was concerned. And so he talks about, at the beginning of verse 20, he says, Lest when I come, that's talking about the next time he goes to visit, in verse 21, and lest when I come again, again talking about his uh, planned third visit. In chapter 13 and verse 1, this is the third time I am coming to you. Um, and in verse 2 of chapter 13, I told you before and tell you, uh, tell you beforehand, and uh, that's to foretell you, I told you before, uh, the second time and being absent now. So Paul's going back for a third time. That's what he's proposing to do. This letter, what he's trying to say is, Things haven't gone well since day one. Things still aren't going well because you're getting reports. 
from his co-laborers. And his fear is, and that's what verses 20 and 21 are, his fear is that when he gets there, he's going to find things fairly unchanged or in a, in a state of disarray spiritually. That's what he's fearful of. So he has some expected results for the Corinthians. And in verse 20, for I fear lest, <clears throat> and you know, he uses this word lest uh, three times here. In these two verses, uh, and in this first uh, use of the word, uh, perhaps is a good uh, rendition of that in the English. Uh, in any way or not in any way, uh, depending on the positive negative nature of what you're saying here, uh, in any way. So you could say, for I fear that perhaps when I come, I shall not find, etc. Or uh, for I fear... Uh, that in any way, when I come, I shall not find you such as I would. How would Paul want to find them? Would is a word for desire. How would, how would Paul like to find them? Thriving spiritually as a church, strong, firm, obedient, unwavering in their faith. And he says, I'm fearing uh, that in any way or in some way when I come, I will not find you that way. That was his heart's, the heaviness on his heart, if you will. He was grieved from the thought because the reports and, and all of the events that have taken place led him down a path to think that they need to be strengthened in the Lord. They need to be strengthened. So I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would. How I'd like to find you spiritually strong. And I also fear... Um, that in some way I shall be found unto you such as you would not. How would they not want him to come? As a disciplinarian. That's how, he, that's how he went the second time. As a disciplinarian. Because sin in the church, sin in the church, open sin in the church, op known sin in the church must be purged. Matthew 18 gives us that prescription from the Lord. That, you know, you take, you know, you hear something, you take one or two witnesses with you and you try to verify the fact of the sin. And then if, the per, if, it, if it's still the way it is, if the person's still in sin, and you know that, then you, you take it before the church. And if the person still doesn't repent or turn from the sin, you take them out of the church. You put them out. It's all done in love. The reason you put them out of the church is that they will then get it. They will then understand they'll be so shamed by the church that they'll want to come back and they'll repent of that sin. They'll turn from it. They'll come back and confess it and be restored to the fellowship of the church. So that's what they didn't want. They didn't want Paul to come as a disciplinarian. And the reason uh, there uh, that they wouldn't want him to come back as a disciplinarian, the next word, lest, uh, means that in no way, uh, that is, that, that Paul would in no way want to find these things when he comes back. Debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, which is conceit or pride, and tumults, which are disorders. And, you know, there's much to be said about all of these things, but we're not going to go through each one. But I do want to point out a couple of important things. Most of them are sort of uh, understood well just by repeating the word there. But I want to say something about debates there. Uh, there was a lot of strife. And that strife and contentions within the church. When Paul wrote his first letter, when Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthian church, he addressed that, and that was, that, was, that was the main issue around him calling them carnal and carnal and living in the flesh because there were debates and strifes and contentions among the people. They weren't getting along with each other. They, they weren't loving each other like it was required by God. So debates, envyings is not really envy here. Um, envy is desiring to deprive somebody of something that they have, uh, but it's really jealousy, and um, in today's language, the root word would be translated jealousy there, 
and jealousy is desiring to have the same or the same sort of thing that somebody else has. You're jealous of what they have and you would like to have it too. But that was all part of the um, swellings there, the conceit. It was just pride that was swelling up within them. And no doubt the, the strife and contention with the debates was that which was uh, driving the church in the wrong direction. The wrath is hot anger. It's not just, not just being mad, uh, but it's sort of like being raging mad. People were yelling and screaming and all kind of confusion around the church there. Uh, and that stuff was not edifying um, and was not, a re- was not a sign of the church being edified. The sign of the church sort of having a meltdown. Um, now, whisperings is not like backbiting. Backbiting is directly, openly uh, saying something about somebody. Whisperings are secrets that are told about people that you don't want them to know. How many times have you ever told somebody, hey, can I tell you a secret? Just don't tell anybody else, right? <laughs> Why would you want that not known that you're telling somebody that? That is something that's called out here in the Scripture. It's those people that go around and whisper in somebody else's ear. They pull somebody off to the side and they say something about somebody else. And they don't want to get back to the somebody else that they said something about it. What does the scripture say? If if there's an offense, you go directly to that person and deal with them one-on-one. That's the first step. If that doesn't work, take a witness or two and establish the fact. Because... uh, Because harmony and unity in the church is what God desires. He doesn't want people fighting and screaming and dividing each other. And whisperings are divisive. They're divisive. And they were full of divisiveness and and, and, uh, pride. Uh, And usually what makes somebody whisper secretly about somebody else is the pride that I'm better than they are. I'm better. I I don't do that. Let me tell you what they did. And the person you tell it to, you assume, doesn't do it either. When in fact, they may, but you don't know that, right? And then, of course, um, the uh, tumults there are disorders. And the church was disorderly. And in verse 21, and the word lest here means that not or in no way, and literally in no way, when I come again, my God will humble me among you. Um. Why would God humble him before the people? Because if all of this sinfulness is running rampant in the church, or even at any any decent level in the church to to, to be well known, which it obviously was, uh, Paul would be humiliated because they're his children in the faith. You know, he's the one that started the church. He, he, He preached to them for a long time, a couple of years and he's been in communication with them. He sent them a letter, tried to straighten it out. And if he comes again and finds all these things, he'll be humiliated. It's like, nobody's listening to me. It'd be kind of humiliating. So Paul says that uh, perhaps when I come again, my God will humble me among you and that I should bewail many who have sinned. Bewail many who have sinned already and have not repented. Have not repented. Uncleanness is immorality. Uh, A large part of that is sexual immorality, and that was one of the problems when he wrote the first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, They still had not repented. That word means to turn from, to have a change of mind and a change of heart about something so that we, we view it as God views it. We take upon that perspective in having a change of heart and mind. So that's when I come again, my God will humble me among you that I shall bewail many who have not repented of the uncleanness, the immorality of the fornication, that's illicit sexual activity, which they were. And these are things that Paul was made aware of that were happening in the church. And he says, and lasciviousness, that's living a a life of excess, if you will, no restraint You know, sort of, and we see a lot of that going on today. I mean, I can't believe that since Thanksgiving, you know, they now, uh, there are groups of people who are getting together and going into stores that sell expensive things and they're raiding the store and stealing everything, destroying the store and running out. Where's the restraint? There's no restraint. It's like a bunch of wild animals, like a bunch of coyotes running after a deer. 
You know, no hunters around to shoot them with a rifle. But there are, you know, it's just like a bunch of wild animals. And, and Paul is actually looking at them as far as sin is concerned. They don't have the restraint for sin. Who's the restraining force for sin? It's the Holy Spirit who abides within us. He leads and guides us into the truth and he restrains us. He gives us the power and the enablement, the sufficiency to resist sin and the temptation uh, to get there. So he says, <clears throat> which they have committed, which they have committed. He knows that this stuff is going on in the church. He's hesitant, actually hesitant to go back again. He doesn't, he's hesitant to go back again. He wants to give them more time in order to get it right, if you will. Um, and so I want to close with uh, a section over in Ephesians chapter 4. So Paul finds this sorry state of affairs spiritually uh, in the Corinthian church. And he's writing to them to try to correct it, to upbuild the church, get them strong spiritually. So if we look over to Ephesians chapter 4, uh, here's where we can make an application for the same thing. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's going on in your mind. And as much as you've thought it, you've done it already. According to what Jesus says, when you think about doing something, whether it's adultery or murder, things like that, I mean, you've already committed the act. I mean, a lot of times we don't fulfill it in, in the full way because we know that we'll get arrested and go to jail. We don't want to go to jail. But I still hate them. <clears throat> uh, so I don't know how much of that kind of stuff uh, we're loving and kind to many people and maybe most people, but maybe there are people around us that we're not so loving and so kind to. Maybe we haven't expressed the love of Christ to them. But there are many ways in which we deviate from the straight and narrow path of God's word. And they're found here in Ephesians 4, a letter which, writ, which, which Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus uh, explaining uh, the obligations, if you will, so if you look at verse 17, Ephesians 4 and verse 17, and I pretty much just want to read this. I'm not going to do a verse-by-verse verse study, but I'll just make a few comments along the way. But this is a good passage of Scripture to prevent what was happening in the church at Corinth. If every person were to look, and this isn't the only place, it's a good place to find the information in a compact form. But it says in verse 17, Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. We get vain sometimes, don't we? That's one of the issues at Corinth. Pride was a huge issue in Corinth. That's what the false apostles were guilty of. It was all about pride. And the people in the church that were being influenced and persuaded by the false teachers were also being built up with their pride. And they weren't told that it was bad. In fact, they thought it was good. But don't walk as other Gentiles in the vanity of your mind. So sometimes we think that we're so good, you know, be careful what we think about ourselves. We think we're so good that we're not going to be at that level where those people that have problems are at. When in fact, we're probably in the same boat. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance uh, that is in them. Talk, this is talking about the Gentiles who aren't saved, the heathen. <clears throat> it says, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. That's that excess and riotous living, if you will, uh, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Uh, and that's an unrestrained life. Because we're not, we don't, we, we, we're part of the church, member of the church, but we get away from the church, we get in our own, we get in our own element. Sometimes we don't feel restrained by the power of God, the Holy Spirit who resides within us. This is talking about people that have no restraint because they're not saved at all. But Paul's trying to tell the people in the church at Ephesus, you don't need to be like them. We've been transformed. We've been renewed. We're a new person. We don't do those things anymore. So in verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. You haven't learned Christ to be disobedient and reckless in your life and unrestrained in what you do. 
If so be, in verse 21, that you have heard him and have been taught by him, which the Corinthians had been and we have been, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation or manner of life, if you will. Uh, the old man, put off the old man, which is corrupt. It's bad. The word corrupt means bad. Put off the old man according um, to the deceitful lust. Deceitful, we've been deceived by the devil and we desire things we shouldn't be desiring. And we're not constrained by the power of God that's working within us and so we haven't, we haven't put it off. Put it off. He's telling the church at Ephesus, put off these things like a garment, take it off. And in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That spirit is little s. That's the spirit of an individual. Be renewed in your spirit by the Holy Spirit, right? And so in verse 24, and that you put on, you're going to take off the former manner of life, if you will, and you're going to put on the new man or new woman, the word is a word for person, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So we've put on the new man, and it's created in righteousness and holiness. Wherefore, because this is true in verse 25, Paul says, putting away lying. So this is, if you will, putting off from verse 22 concerning the former manner of life. Verse 25, we put away or put off lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Why would you lie to your brother or sister in the Lord? If you really love them, you won't lie to them. One of the greatest, one of the greatest factors in a successful marriage is that people don't lie to each other. They're open and they're honest with each other. They don't deceive each other. They're completely honest and open. Because if it's, if it's open and honest, uh, then you can deal with it as a couple. Uh, but when you're trying to hide something and it's secretive stuff, uh, you're not, you're, you know, talking about the family of Christ here. Um, it says here, for we are members of one another. We are all members of the body of Christ. And in our family, we're all members of the same family, right? Uh, so in verse 26, and of course, you know, believers are all one body. Be, be angry, be angry, but don't sin. There are times to be angry. There's times to get mad. But don't sin when you do. There are things that anger us just by fact that, that they exist or that they happen. But we can address it in a way. And I, the greatest example I've seen is Jesus when he got mad when he went into the temple and he found them selling the animals in the temple for the sacrifices and changing money from people that are traveling out of town. The temple, the place of the house of worship, the house of prayer is not a place to transact business. It's a house of worship. And so he cleaned it out because it wasn't being used as a house of worship. It was using a house of worship and his business. It's not a business. There should be no business activity in the church. And so what happens is he goes down and he cleans. And he grabs a whip and he starts chasing people out. He turns tables over and he was mad. He was angry, but he didn't sin because he was cleaning out God's house. That's what he was doing. The house of God that was used for worship. He was trying to restore the place as a place of worship. <clears throat> he said, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Deal with it and don't let it linger. Verse 27, don't give place to the devil. Place means opportunity. If we're going to nip it in the bud, as far as sin is concerned, we've got to start back at the temptation. The way you handle the temptation, because all temptation comes from the devil, God tempts no man, no woman. It comes from the devil. We have to stop it right there. Don't give an opportunity to the devil. When temptation comes, turn away from it. Call upon God. Call upon God to restore your strength through the power of the Holy Spirit and through His Word. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, uh, the thing which is good that he may have to give and that needeth. reason people steal is because they, they want something that they can't afford. They want something they can't get. Uh, and so they go steal it. That's not the way Christians live. And you know, there's a lot of ways to steal. <laughs> you can steal subtly where nobody even knows. And you can even justify it in your own mind. Let no corrupt communication, <clears throat> oh boy, the word corrupt means bad. We talked about it a moment ago. 
No bad communication to come out of your mouth. None. Seasoned with salt as a sweet savor unto the Lord. What we say should glorify the Lord at all times. So we shouldn't have bad words being uttered or bad thoughts or bad um, ideas coming out of our mind. But the contrast is that which is good to the edifying, use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, <clears throat> by whom you are sealed until the day of redemption. <clears throat> Don't grieve Him. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Malice is intent to do harm. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. <clears throat> we have difficulty forgiving other people. You've heard people say, and maybe you've said yourself, I just can't forgive them for that. This is as, as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. <clears throat> when God forgave me, he didn't say, whoops, I got this one thing I could never forgive you for. <clears throat> no, I came in faith and God forgave me of all my sins. He wiped it, my slate clean. White as snow, as far as the east is from the west. <clears throat> Eternally separated <clears throat> from my sins. <clears throat> but we forgive other people that way? No, we got that little grudge. We got that memory. We've got that thing that somebody's done. We just can't get over it. You know, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Leaven is indicative of sin in that phrase in the Bible. But a little bit of leaven leavens a whole lump. So we get by with one little thing. When we, when we accept one thing that's a sin, <clears throat> as it's all right, and I don't need to repent, I don't need to confess that sin, then that is the beginning of a growth. Then there'll be other things that will come along the same way. And before you know it, we'll be like the Corinthians were. Paul was trying to correct the church so that they glorified the Lord in all that they did. And that they... They were be characterized by this verse 32, being kind one to another. They were not <clears throat> tender-hearted, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God has forgiven us. And when you can when you can begin to forgive other people as God forgave you, it's powerful. Powerful. You forgive people for things that before you surrendered to that. Dictate from the Lord that you couldn't do. And then when you do, there's such a, an ease and a comfort that comes over us. Because God is the one who comforts us. God is the one who comforts us. He's the God of all comfort. There's no comfort received except God's given it to us. If we use something else to comfort us, it's wrong. God is the one who comforts us. And we recognize, and so this is a good area where that is applicable because forgiveness is something that is not just the word you say, but it's that which, you know, you might, other people expect you to say, I forgive them. And you say, well, I forgive them. But in your heart, you're really saying, I'm never going to forgive them. But I know that's the right thing to say. We've got to be upright and just in all our dealings before the Lord. And the end of chapter 4 tells us that. Chapter 5, I'm not going to go into that, but chapter 5 tells us we're not even to engage in these activities, the sinners or the Gentiles, the heathen, as Paul called them there, engaged in it. We're not even, it's not even to be named once among us. God expects, what is it Peter said? We'll close with this thought. Be ye holy, even as I am holy. God is completely separated from sin. He can't sin. There's no, no guile was found in Christ when he lived on the earth. He committed no sins, had done no wrong. Everything was perfect. He was the only person who lived on earth that's perfect. God wants us to be, and so the word holy means separated, separated from sin. What we need to do is to be separated from sin and separated to God. So if you're just separated from sinful acts, 
uh, you might think that you're a self-righteous person where, where nothing's wrong. <laughs> but that's not the way it is. Holiness is a spiritual term used by the Lord to define God, and it also should define all believers. Not necessarily that we're perfect, but that our goal and our striving is to be separated from sin and separated unto God. To be at His disposal to use however He wants, whenever He wants, wherever He wants. That's where we need to be. Be holy even as God is holy. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Father, we're thankful for Your love. We're thank you, thankful for Your mercy. Father, you're so merciful to us. You're so compassionate. You're so kind and gracious. Father, we thank you for your grace. Truly, it is amazing. Your love, <clears throat> your grace, your mercy, it's all amazing. We can't attain unto that level of love, grace, and mercy. We can't attain unto it. But we can strive to be like you. And in so doing, we can be mature spiritually in your mind, which is uh, the real application for the word holy in a believer's life, is to be spiritually mature. Father, these Corinthians were not spiritually mature. As, as a whole, the church was characterized by spiritual immaturity. Father, may we not be named to be in the same category. And Father, we know that uh, it takes complete surrender to you um, and, and, to, and, and, and a pathway of spiritual growth in order to arrive to spiritual maturity. And so, Father, may we strive for that spiritual maturity. May we strive to be like our Savior. May we strive to imitate you, to be like you, Father. And so we... We leave here today with these thoughts in our minds of all the things that were wrong in the church at Corinth and realize that these things are still wrong in the churches today. We know that it's going to, get, it's going to wax worse and worse, it's going to get worse and worse over time as we approach, approach the day of Christ's coming to take His children home. And so, Father, may we be on guard and may we resist the devil and give him no opportunity in His tempting of us. Father, may we our mind and heart be stayed on You. To be firm in our convictions and our faith. To be strong in our confidence towards You. Father, we know that You will fulfill uh, Your Word to us. That You will guide us and direct us. And give us that which we need. And so, Lord, may we be content with what we have. Knowing that if You wanted us to have more, You'd give it to us. And Father, we're just so thankful uh, again for Your Word, for this opportunity to study it, and may it take root within our hearts and grow as we give our undivided attention to it on a regular basis. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.